Hi, I'm Emily Paulson from the Nevada Homeless Alliance, and this is Compassionate Las Vegas, the podcast. Welcome to Compassionate Las Vegas, the podcast. I'm your host, Will Rucker, and today's guest is someone that you need to know. Emily Paulson, Executive Director of Nevada Homeless Alliance, is joining us, and we're going to talk about this subject. We're going to be candid. We're going to be bold. We're going to be transparent and honest, and I hope that you join us in this conversation through your comments, through your engagement in this, this important cause, and of course, through sharing the podcast. So Emily, welcome to Compassionate Las Vegas. Hi, Will. Thank you so much for having me um, on the podcast and for holding this important conversation. Yeah, and thank you for joining. I believe this subject is one that a lot of people are really passionate about and also lack the information to really get involved and make a change with. So thank you for, first of all, for all the work that you're doing and then for joining the show today. Absolutely. The first question I wanna ask you, I'm just gonna dive right in today. How do you define compassion? Personally, as a, as a person of faith, I define compassion as my faith in action. It's um, giving love, giving grace, um, doing the right thing, always. Wow. I, I really like how you frame that, doing the right thing always, because that means even when it's tough, even when people may disagree, it's still important to do the right thing. So thank you for sharing that. Now, if you could just give us a 80,000 foot view of the work you do day to day through your organization. Yeah, at the Nevada Homeless Alliance, we do work at that 80,000 foot view, actually. Uh, we work at the systems level, so we advocate at the local, state, and federal level. Um, we uh, coordinate services, uh, uh, mostly in Southern Nevada, but sometimes um, policy-wise, uh, statewide. Um, for example, we just had the recent opportunity to work with um, organizations across the state and um, the Department of Health, Finance, and Policy regarding a new um, 1959 waiver program. Um, but a lot of our programming is focused in Southern Nevada. We host comprehensive uh, outreach events known as Project Homeless Connect events, where we bring, um, depending on the size of the event, anywhere from uh, right now, they're very, very tiny with just 10 organizations to upwards of 150 organizations to provide immediate same day services. Um, and we also provide training uh, to homeless service providers on evidence-based practices and professional skills. And lastly, education. We, we, um, we think it's important that uh, the community understand the issue of homelessness and how they can be involved, um, what the various solutions are. Um, we believe, you know, and, and Maya Angelou put it best, right? When we, when we know better, we do better. So we're really committed to, to increasing public awareness about homelessness and the various solutions that we have as a community and as a nation. Wonderful. I love that you are at this level because that is really where those the lasting change occurs. Now you mentioned Project Homeless Connect and that rang a bell. Is that something you used to do at, at like the schools and you'd have a lot of vendors and, and a lot, a lot, a lot of people would show up? Yes, yeah. Some of our largest events uh, served over 3,000 people who are experiencing homelessness or who are um, in need of a hand up. Um, we used to hold these events for many years at Cashman Center, and when Cashman Center closed, um, we moved it to the Champion Center, and this actually was the first year in 27 years that our community did not host that large event, but we've continued with a twice-monthly, much smaller, uh, scaled-down events um, that are held with, you know, social distancing um, protocols in place and various safety protocols in place, and we think that's important, right? Because the, the the need people have to connect to services hasn't hasn't changed. That hasn't gone away. Um, so we just had to modify and tailor uh, tailor the event to to meet those needs um, in a smaller version. And we call it Mini but Mighty Project Homeless Connect. It's also known as Pop Up Project Homeless Connect. It's a mobile event 
So um, we move, move it across the valley to areas of high need to connect with people who might otherwise have trouble connecting with those services. I love how you've been innovative in that. I, I bring it up because I used to participate through an organization that I work for in those events, and they were so powerful. One other thing I'd like to point out is people experiencing homelessness. I like how you frame that and put people first. Why did you choose that particular way to, to express? Well, I think that's, it's just important we remember that um, people are experiencing something. Homelessness is not, uh, I think, uh, shouldn't be defining of a person. Um, I think the term, um, you know, holds a lot of stigma, unfortunately, um, and I think it's just important we re- we remember that um, when we're when we're talking about this situation that we're talking about it as an experience, not um, you know um, as as a label, so to speak. Um, I think it's important we just remember this is a this is this is an, a situation that impacts our neighbors, um, people in in our community, people just like you and me. Who is the typical person that experiences homelessness? Uh, well, I'll just, I'll say this, uh, homelessness is disproportionately impacts people of color in Southern Nevada and nationally, uh, people of color are overrepresented, um, in our homeless population, we have an overrepresentation of, of young people, um, overrepresentation of LGBTQ people. Um, we have veterans experiencing homelessness, children with, uh, families with children, seniors, um, so it's there isn't one typical person who's experiencing homelessness in in our nation and particularly not in Southern Nevada. Um, it, it really is um, something that, you know, it cuts through every um, every t- group of person, you know, is, is um, can experience homelessness in Southern Nevada and wow. is experiencing homelessness in Southern Nevada. Yeah, do you know how many people currently are experiencing homelessness? So, no, unfortunately, we don't know how the pandemic has already impacted um, the number of people who are experiencing homelessness. Every January, our community does a point in time homeless census. And so, based on the results of that last um, count, you know, physical count, um, the number of people who are homeless in our community on that on that single night in January it was about 5,200. Um, but that was pre-pandemic, and uh, we know eviction rates are already soaring, even with um, some um, protections in place through the CDC federal eviction moratorium. Um, we already know that the eviction rates are still spiking despite that federal eviction moratorium, and um, we know that there are people falling into homelessness anecdotally. Um, at, at really high rates right now, but we don't have a solid grasp yet on what that looks like. And we know that that's going to continue, right? We know, unfortunately, that um, many more people are going to fall into homelessness over the coming months and year. And um, and that's really unfortunate. And we don't know um, yet what that looks like in terms of numbers. It's really hard because it's it's unfortunate, but I don't think unfortunate is quite the right word. It doesn't hold enough weight to it to say, well, that's unfortunate. Uh, Just coincidentally, yesterday I happened to be downtown and doing some work and it was just before dark. And as I parked, Thankfully, it was free because, you know, on the weekends, you get free parking. So, you know, one bright side. Uh, But as I was parking, my heart shattered because people were already sleeping on benches. The entire street was lined with people. And I felt in that moment so powerless, so helpless. And I experienced what I call empathetic distress because at that moment, my concern actually shifted from the the issues they were facing to my own issue of not being able to help. What are some of the things that people just need to know? What What are the best ways for us to take back that sense of agency and be able to actually help our homeless brothers and sisters. Yeah, well first I want to first I just want to agree, right? That 
unfortunately is not the right, was not the right word to use. And it really doesn't um, encapsulate how I also, I share that, that grief and devastation will, um, that sense of frustration and powerlessness. I know I'm adding more, more words there than you, than you share, but that, that's my feeling when I also drive around downtown Las Vegas and in particular in the corridor that we, that we know as the homeless corridor. And I see hundreds of people in the cold, barely dressed, freezing, lined up in crowded conditions, lacking a safe place to sleep because our shelters, um, you know, are they've reduced in the, the number of people that they can serve. But even prior to this pandemic, I, and I think this is something that, that needs to be said because it's not well known, is that our community only has the capacity to shelter a third just one third of the people who are in need of shelter every night. And our shelters, even pre-pandemic, were full most, most nights throughout the entire year. And we actually have one of the highest rates of people who are unsheltered in the nation. Our community is top five and has been year after year because of that, because of that lack of resources in our, that we only have enough beds in our community to provide shelter and housing to a third of the people who need it on any given night. And that was pre-pandemic, right? And now our shelters have had to reduce the number of people they can serve each night to practice social distancing. And we have more people falling into homelessness. Um, there's just no safe, there's just no safe place for many people to go. Um, and that's unacceptable. That's a better word. Well, that's the word I think we should, that's how I feel about it, right? It's unacceptable that we have thousands of people in our community who don't have a safe place to stay at night. Um, and so I think that we have to start there. I think we have to agree as a community um, that that's unacceptable. We need our leaders and our elected officials to agree with us that, that, that this is unacceptable. Um, and we have to do something more um, about it. So I think, um, the more of us who are talking about this, who are seeing this is unacceptable, um, are advocating for additional resources and services, that, that that's a place to start. And then acting on that by partnering with homeless service organizations in a variety of ways. Um, some of the most simple, and, but yet most impactful ways are um, providing um, opportunities for employment and housing. So if you work for an employer or are an employer, you should absolutely partner with a homeless service organization to fill any open positions you have. Um, don't make assumptions about the skill or professional background that people have who may be experiencing homelessness. Um, there, you know, there, there is someone out there who is a perfect fit for the job that you may have open and they just need that, that connection, that length the opportunity. There's a lot of stuff you mentioned earlier around people experiencing homelessness. What is it that drives that stigma? Because a lot of people feel as though they, they're choosing this. They, they made bad choices. They, whatever the laundry list of excuses we give to, to make it feel more acceptable. But help us to understand a little bit better. That is, you know, it is an interesting relationship. I think that um, stigma has with um, personal feelings around control, right? I think it is easier uh, to ignore a problem um, and leave a problem as, you know, the status quo when we can say, well, that person made a bad choice or, you know, these thousands of people have made um, bad choices. Um, um, perhaps they're not deserving of help, but I don't believe that. I think everyone deserves a home. I really believe housing is a human right. I think regardless of whether someone made a bad choice or not, that they are deserving of housing. Um, we have to create the housing opportunities that meet everyone's needs in our community. Um, so I think we, if we acknowledge again, you know, start there that housing is a human right. Everyone needs housing. Everyone deserves housing. Um, our community is healthier as a whole when everyone has housing, um, that that cuts right through, right through stigma, right? What about people that 
want that in their community. They don't want that in their neighborhood. They don't want, you know, those people around their kids. What would you say to that? Well, you know, as, as, I, as we were talking about just a moment ago, uh, homelessness is something that impacts many uh many different people. So there isn't just one, you know, group of, of people, or there isn't a those people who experience homelessness. Um, just because someone lacks a safe place to live does not make them a criminal. It doesn't make them a bad person. It doesn't make them a dangerous person. Um, I think, I think that's what we have to, what we have to recognize, right? And um, certainly, you know, um, if you don't want uh, people having to sleep in a park, with, um, then we again need to we need to say to our to, to to decision makers, right, to our leader, community leaders, that you know what what are you doing to provide more housing in our community so that people don't have to live in the park in my neighborhood, right? Um, so people don't have to live under the freeway in my neighborhood. I think that that's the most important question, right? Certainly, you sh we shouldn't have people having to sleep in our park. I mean, if we have to just remember that again, you know, we don't have, have the resources. We have just enough shelter beds for a third of the people who are homeless in our community on any given night, and that was pre-pandemic. So this is, a, this is a problem about resources, in my opinion, not people making a choice um, to be homeless. You know, we have over, you know, 1,200 people every month on a waiting list for placement into a homeless service housing program. So when you say about resources, let's dive in. Is, is it saying that we as a city don't have the funds, like the, the monetary resources? I, I see a big, tall, blue building on the strip that's just there. And I would imagine that there's probably at least 1,200 rooms that could house someone. And I'm just throwing that out there. I'm sure there are way above, you know, my understanding as to why um, and it costs and things of that nature. But when I see these, these empty spaces, I just wonder why is it that we can't utilize them? So what, what are the barriers that we're experiencing and what are the resources we're, we're missing? Yeah, I think that, thank you so much for asking that. That's a really important question because just as we hear people say, right, I don't want there to be people experiencing homelessness in my neighborhood. We also hear people say, I don't want affordable housing in my neighborhood, right? Um, and so we have, <laughs> uh, you know, it's called NIMBYism, not in my backyard, right? And we, we need to turn that on its head to Yimbyism, yes, in my backyard. Yes, I want people to be housed in my community. I want everyone to have a safe place to call home in my community. Um, and I and I and even you know I can say that uh, uh, our office we we're co-located with Lutheran Social Services on a piece of land that's also shared with Nevada Hand, uh, where they built a beautiful affordable housing complex. And before that was built, it was just this uh, vacant plot of land that was known to be um, an area where um, people tent camped on this empty plot of land. And the county in that case owned that plot of land. And they said, we're gonna give this land through a grant process away to nonprofits to share and house people and do some good. So land is really important, right? Um, and where you locate services is really important. Um, I feel like I might have sidetracked away from your question a little bit, but, but the, yes, Will, we have to look at what land do we have available? What existing housing resources? What buildings do, do our jurisdictions own, right? That the city already owns, city of Las Vegas, that Clark County already loan, owns, city of North Las Vegas, and how can we repurpose those buildings to be used um, as, as housing, as affordable housing. How do we preserve our existing affordable housing? Um, this is something um, that's really important and everyone know too, that we have the greatest shortage of affordable housing for our lowest income community members in the entire nation. Our rental market might be more affordable than you know, San Francisco, LA, New York, um, but it's an inventory issue, right? We have far fewer units um, uh, that are affordable in our community for the number of people who, who need them. So we have a huge percentage of our community is severely rent burdened, where they're paying 50%, 80% of their monthly income 
towards their housing. So a financial emergency happens and oftentimes it will fall into homelessness. So that's a really, um, you know, big piece, right? We really need the city um, and the county to invest in affordable housing, make land available. Um, that's really a, a really important uh, part of the solution. Um, but it's a good question. Well, I think that we have to, we, we, we need to continue to ask is what do we already have in terms of housing and resources? Um, I would also say that we, um, we have a misdirection of existing funding in my, right now, in my opinion, where um, I think that the city is spending more money downstream on the issue of homelessness, more money on policing, um, street cleanup, encampment sweeps. Quite honestly, the, what happened uh, recently, you know, where 26 huts were destroyed at a large homeless encampment that was shared between the city of Las Vegas and North Las Vegas was probably a really expensive endeavor when you consider the heavy equipment that was brought in, the presence of law enforcement. Um, so these, these sorts of responses cost far more than, um, than the evidence-based housing solutions to homelessness, which is permanent supportive housing, rapid rehousing, and housing-focused emergency shelter. We know that these solutions work. We have them in our community. They're working very well. We haven't been able to take them to scale um, for a variety of reasons, and funding is a big piece of that. And, I, and I, I've argued for a long time that we need to redirect existing funding into those evidence-based solutions and away from um, downstream responses. You brought that up earlier, and the things that are interrelated to this, you mentioned affordable housing. And affordable is one of those terms that is so ambiguous. What's affordable to me is not necessarily what's affordable to Bill Gates. So the people that make the decisions when they hear affordable housing, their starting point may be just completely different from the reality that is within our city. So when we talk about wages and employment, obviously right now during this pandemic, we, we are really hard hit. I understand all of that. So let's just take ourselves out of this moment and think more broadly, because this didn't just happen. We didn't just have this, this large population exist. Are there things that your organization is working on or partnering with others on that would help to increase the wages here in Las Vegas? I think we we would absolutely be supportive of uh, policy measures that would increase wages. Um, I absolutely agree, Will, that that needs to happen. Um, we need that there's a growing gap um, between uh, housing affordability and, um, and wages. And we, while we need to increase the availability of affordable housing, um, we need to also be increasing wages. Um, but there are, I know some really great organizations right now who are leading that effort to have that conversation. Um, um, so, and, and we, we support that effort. I have not quite your real house, but I do think that it's an important factor because I personally know people experiencing homelessness who work a full-time job or two. And for me, it's, it's maddening. How is it possible you're expending this much effort to work and you still don't have the, the type of income to support a home? a room. <laughs> it, it's really, um, again, to our word, unacceptable. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I'd, I'd like to, to transition into is how do we get that buy-in that we recognize this as an unacceptable issue and also understand it's unacceptable and it is fixable. It's unacceptable and we already have, I know we say we're lacking resources, but we really don't. It's the allocation that you just mentioned. 
we, we need to reallocate. We need to redirect. We need to, to figure out something different. Be innovative. My, my favorite term is reimagine Las Vegas. You know, what, what can we do? And, and perhaps maybe the better question would be, what are you doing to help facilitate that? And where can we support you in that? So specifically around the, the increase in wages, you're right that that's, um, that, that's not the central focus of our organization, but we know it is of, of other um, organizations in the community. And so um, should another uh, bill move forward in the legislative session that would address that, we would most likely, depending on the bill language, be supportive of that. Um, I think putting a face on that, story you just told of a friend is something that that we can be helpful with right that we are talking with elected officials and we're not just talking about numbers right like you know here's here's you know the number of people who are working in our community and still homeless but providing an opportunity for someone like your friends right people like your friends to um to say, I am working full time or I'm working two jobs, right? And I still cannot afford to live in Southern Nevada. What are you doing about that, right? To elevate those voices um, is something that we're committed to doing, um, helping people who are living on the streets to have their voices heard. Those, those are important things that our, our organization um, is committed to doing. I think we have to hear um, from people who are directly impacted by these issues. Um, as, as you know, that, that that's one of the most important things that we can do is to hear directly from Southern Nevadans who are who are being hurt by these issues. Um, in that, we're not going to continue to get anywhere if we um, ignore ignore that relationship year after year. We, you know, in addition to the living wage discussion, right? We want to help uh, decision makers understand the relationship um, between educational success and housing stability, right? When our students don't have a safe, stable place to live, we know that they struggle academically. Um, uh, health outcomes are impacted. Housing is healthcare now more than ever, right? Housing is healthcare. Um, um, so all of these issues, right? Um, education, healthcare, food insecurity um, are, are linked to, you know, our, our link to fixing those issues is housing, making sure every Southern Nevadan has a safe, stable place to call home, right? An affordable place to call home. If a family is paying 50% of their monthly income on housing, they're not, uh, they're not able to provide the food security, right, that they need. Perhaps they're not able to afford health care. They're not able to afford um, preschool or childcare for their children. There's so many lost opportunities in our community for our community to be well and whole when we don't invest in ensuring that everyone in our community has a safe, stable place to live. Wow. Home, uh, housing is healthcare. That, that puts it in a whole new light for me. It's kind of one of those aha moments because I, I hadn't thought of it that way, but, but I absolutely agree. And more than it's, it's health care, it's human care because we really, we have to get back to this idea of common humanity. I, I have friends from all over the spectrum, politically and religiously and all of this. And one thing that we do have in common is we really do believe that the welfare of humanity should come first. How we get there is where we kind of diverge. But I also want to just take a step back and, and encourage the audience to, to understand I'm not trying to be hard on anyone and I, I'm not trying to, to uh, poke a bear here. And I also want to be frank and I, I want to be able to have the conversation and discuss these things because sometimes we have to hear it to hear it. And right now, I don't know that we've all heard it. So, Emily, thank you again for, for your candor and, and joining in this. What are you seeing that is inspiring you at this moment? There's a lot of uh, good work happening in our community right now, um, especially through um, partnership and collaboration. So um, since April, our community has been uh, sheltering people in motel rooms. And that's, I, I give the credit there to um, Clark County and Help of Southern Nevada. 
Um, our organization has had the, the privilege to partner with them to um, ensure the people who are being placed in those motel rooms for, for shelter right now have access to food. Um, so we, were, we uh, coordinate a team of volunteers twice a week to come and deliver um, groceries and the food is uh, donated by Share Village, which is another really great uh, key partner in this, um, in this project. Um, so there's also a, an effort called Operation Home, where all of the local governments are working together with nonprofits right now to, uh, to house more people. Um, and this, uh, the goal is to, to provide housing to uh, 2,000 and 22 people by 2022. Um, so that's that's some good, there's some good work happening there, good partnership and collaboration. I think uh, collaboration obviously is, um, is key to continued progress. Um, we need our, our local governments to work together and work with the, our, non, our nonprofits, which they are, um, and to not, you know, um, do uh, certain things that are, you know, counter, to the the health and well-being um, of our community and the treatment of people in encampments is is a key part of that, right? Um, we need to have a regional agreement to follow the CDC guidance on encampments right now. And um, until we do have enough shelter in our community for everyone, which we do not, and despite the progress I just you know discussed, we we're still very far from having enough. Um, beds and, and shelter or motel rooms or other housing placements for people who are experiencing homelessness in our community. So until we um, have that in place, we need to uh, provide services to people who are in encampments, um, health care, um, uh, COVID testing, COVID treatment, uh, connection and link to, to the housing that is available. Um, and I think we need to actually applaud efforts of some community organizations who've gone even further to provide some type of temporary shelter um, for people who are unsheltered in our community. So they have some form of isolation and safety. Um, and we need to follow CDC guidance on that and, and leave those encampments in place and bring, bring services to people in encampments, hygiene, toilets, hand washing sinks, mobile showers. Um, so, so that's another thing that, that needs to happen. And, um, I, d I do want to just, you know, in the spirit of what you were saying earlier, Will, that we need to have honest, direct conversations. Um, there, there have been um, situations recently, you know, where, where we saw, you know, one large encampment in particular where 26 huts were destroyed um, by the city of Las Vegas and the city of North Las Vegas. And we really, we feel strongly that that, um, that should not have happened, that that was not a compassionate act. That, that was not an act that was in the, the best interest, certainly of the people who were living in that encampment, nor our community as a whole. Um, it ignored public health, health advisement from the CDC um, and connections to services were lost for the people who were living in, in that encampment. Um, personal belongings like cell phones, um, identification, um, paperwork that people had to work on disability benefits and housing placements were lost. And that, you know, to come back to the word unacceptable, that that was unacceptable how that went down. Um, so I just, I think that's important. And, you know, when this podcast will air, that might already, uh, you know, people may have already forgotten about that. But I think it's really important. We, we have a regional approach, right? And that we're in agreement and how we're going to serve our most vulnerable community members right now while we work to build more housing capacity. How did that happen? Okay, well, I think I can't speak to why the encampment was destroyed. I think that would be a better question for the city of Las Vegas, city of North Las Vegas and the Department of Transportation. But I will tell you this, that um, since April, um, there had, the, the encampment, uh, was, um, receiving services. So the health district was coming, um, periodically 
we held a um, to do testing that is, and to you know provide information to people about how to take precautions uh, against the spread of COVID-19, what to do if they experience certain symptoms. Um, the city of North Las Vegas, in partnership with the health district, brought in dumpsters, uh, porta potties, and sinks, and that's um, uh, in alignment with the CDC guidance. That's what the CDC says local government should do for large encampments is to leave them intact and um, make sure that their people have a place to use the restroom and a place to wash their hands and a place to discard their trash. Um, so we also held an event there. We held one of our pop-up Project Homeless Connect events there. There were various groups like Food Not Bombs who were providing um, food and some other connection services, um, some harm reduction services like needle exchange. Um, and uh, the, there was a notice po posted a few different times and it, it didn't appear to be, to be legitimate because it didn't have any insignia from local government. Didn't, um, the, the notice didn't state you know, who, who, it, who was posting it, didn't have a date of posting and it didn't have a date saying that the notice would be enforced. So um, you know, we've, we visited the encampment several times and uh, spoke to some of the residents who were feeling very anxious right about you know when is this going to happen is this going to happen um i you know that this hud is really helping me right now to have a, a lock on my door to be able to, to uh, feel safe at night um one couple right a senior couple the woman explained that she was finally able to take care of some stuff during the day to help with her disability claim um so um it, I think it's really unfortunate what happened, but I can't really answer your question on like, why why did this this happen? We, I mean, we saw that the city of North Las Vegas was cleaning the encampment and the, uh, the wash without displacing people. So they were able to go in and clear out the wash and clean around the encampment and provide the dumpsters and the, the toilets without displacing people. So, so I'm not sure why, um, why they felt they had to, to remove people and destroy the huts in order to clean um, the area. I asked the question so broadly as how it happens is because my when I first heard it, I didn't get it. And then it came up in a meeting that I was attending and with more explanation, I'm like, how does that even, how, how does that even happen? Because it's so unbelievable, particularly during the pandemic. So thank you for, for sharing that background and, and a little more detail. We will definitely have a conversation with the city about it because I think that it's important to, to get a broader picture so that it doesn't continue to happen. With people that wanna make a difference, I often see you know, families will, will make up meals and, and drive down the streets and, and give them uh, out in you know disposable containers and things of that nature. Can you talk a little bit about how helpful that is and or not, and what else they could be doing to to really feel like they're making a difference? Yeah, that's that's a great question too, Will. Um, we on our website actually have what we call a menu of opportunity and it lists about 50 different ways that people can um, partner with homeless service organizations um, to, to have food needs met, to help um, people get their food needs met, shelter needs met, transportation needs met. Um, we, we worked with numerous organizations in our community to hear, you know, what do you need most to, to serve people better? What do you need from the community? And that's how we, um, we generated that. Also hearing, you know, directly from people who are experiencing homelessness about what do you, what are your top needs? Um, so there are, there are many more needs beyond um, um, meals. Um, I think if, if someone is going to provide a meal, that they should partner with an organization to do that, who has relationships with people, um, where there are um, there's an opportunity for the food to be served safely, for an opportunity for people to use the restroom afterwards, to wash their, their hands. I think that's particularly important right now during the pandemic, right? Um, uh, but there's some wonderful organizations in town that provide um, nutritious, healthy meals. And you can partner with with one of them um, to serve people. You have to think about it this way: if you were experiencing homelessness, would you want someone to drive up to you on the corner um, and just hand you something? 
would you would you prefer them to ask you how can i help you how can i help you and if that need is i'm hungry can let me go let me go get you something to eat what else what else do you need i need to fit i need i need money to get on the bus across town to get in a shelter tonight and if it's if it's on your heart to uh, provide money for a bus pass and or a bus pass, right? Carrying bus passes around is is a great way to meet a need in the community, right? But I think we have to let's start there. Let's just ask, what? It, how can I help you? Yeah, no, I, I don't want to skip past what you just said, which is ask. Take the time to say, what do you actually need? And one of these things that we do, as I mentioned, when I saw those those people, just the, the feeling of distress that I personally experienced, I could then try to alleviate some way by making a meal. And sometimes what we do in the name of helping others is really in the name of helping ourselves, making us feel as though we've done something, but it's not actually making the type of difference that we could with those exact same ten dollars it could be you know spent yes. so much differently um so i just want to i'm glad that you brought it up that way and if we really just take the time to ask i think that will also help to overcome stigma it'll mm-hmm. break down some of those barriers it will then humanize the homeless because again as we said oh those are homeless people no these are people experiencing homelessness i think just having that two-minute conversation can really be transformative in our last few minutes, is there anything else you'd like to share that you really feel is important for our audience to hear? I think it's important when we're feeling that sense of anger, powerlessness, grief, right? That, you know, how is it, how is this that I'm seeing so much suffering in my community? Um, to list, lean into that, listen to that call in your heart and, and be compassionate. Look someone in the eye and say, you know, first let them know I see you, and then listen, right? I hear, I hear you, and let me help you. And if it is something that's within your financial means, within the time you have in your day, do it. You know, do it. Start there. Um, I think we, you know, that act, simple act of kindness, that moment that you give someone um, some hope. That could be just what they needed in that day to to get to another day, right? Um, partner with homeless service organizations in town. There are so many great organizations in Las Vegas who need your help. They need your time. They need your advocacy. Um, they they need your money if you have it. Um, so please check out that menu of opportunity on our website. Again, it has about 50 different ways that you can partner with homeless service organizations in Southern Nevada and list all the organizations in town too that really need your help, including ours. We love, we'd love to have your help as well. So we, we're always in need of volunteers and, um, and donors. And, you know, we're a very small uh, team. Our organization only has four staff. And so volunteers are really the lifeblood of our organization. We couldn't do anything we do without the support of volunteers. So we'd love to have your help if that you're looking for ways to serve. And what is your website? Our website is uh, NevadaHomelessAlliance.org. NevadaHomelessAlliance.org. Perfect. And we'll put it in the description of the episode as well so people can access it easily. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your compassion and for your light. I'm so grateful for the time you've shared today. And this won't be our last conversation by any means. Uh, know that Compassion in Las Vegas is behind your efforts. Homelessness is something that we seek to eradicate, and we will. We, we recognize it's unacceptable, and we know that we can do something about it. So we will, and we are. So thank you for, for all of that. And for the audience, thank you for listening and giving your attention to this important subject. Get involved, as Emily mentioned. Visit her website and check out her partners and the work that she's doing. And take the time to, to at least say hello and share a smile with someone that is experiencing homelessness. Right now, we should be wearing masks, so you've got to smile, as Tyra Bank. <laughs> smile with okay. your eyes. So smile with, with your a smile with an act of kindness. Smile with an act of kindness. I'm going to do that as a hashtag for like Twitter or something. I love that.
Awesome. Well, again, thank you, Emily, and we will leave it there. Thank you so much, Will. We need to move upstream and look at things like mental health and substance use. We need to move upstream and talk about living wages. We need to move upstream and talk about access to primary health care. The reasons that people are homeless are as varied as the people who are homeless.